Our speaker for this morning is Mark Lance. Uh, Mark was born and raised in Ulysses, Kansas, graduated from high school there back in 1986. Um, went to ACU and graduated there, actually was converted there. Um, graduated in 1990 with a degree in education. Uh, married Laurie uh, there, I mean, back in, what, 1990, that's right. Uh, they've got, uh, what, 26 years now of marriage, two sons, Joshua is 20, uh, as a sophomore at OCU, uh, Caleb is 17. He's a junior there at Memphis High School, where Mark has been preaching for the past uh, three years now, six years. It go, time goes by fast. Uh, he was here in school in 2002 and graduated in 2004. Uh, has been preaching for 13 years total now. Uh, Charles uh, had contacted Mark and asked him to talk and to speak to us about burnout, and so. I hope that you will welcome Mark in the same way that we welcome everybody to the pulpit here. Mark, come preach the word. Thank you. It's a great honor to be here with you this morning. I'm glad that Charles asked me to come and talk about this. This has been a very recent experience for me, and so I don't know if this will be a sermon as much as it'll just be some thoughts, and if there's some, I've got a, some papers over there if you want to pick some up, just some thoughts I had, some things I kind of did that helped me with my burnout that might be useful to you as well. The last time I stood at this pulpit, I was here as a student, and I had my senior sermon, and I came around, I was talking, I was standing right here, and my sister-in-law was sitting right where Kevin is, and she stood up and took a picture, and the flash went off, and my mind just went, and I was just standing there, and, and Charles later said, you had the blankest look on your face, <laughs> and I, I just stepped around here, and I just happened to look, and I was like, hopefully one word is going to pop out at me, and it did, and I was able to continue, but I just, so I told my sister-in-law, she's like, well, do you want me to come? I'm like, no, don't come, and don't, don't bring your camera this morning. Anyway, if you don't mind, let's begin with a prayer. Holy Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I pray that the words that are spoken and the thoughts that are expressed will help us all see that burnout is a danger and a problem, and we need to be out in front of it. We need to learn to work through it, and I just pray you will help us in that effort. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In 1998, I was coaching and teaching in Delhart, Texas. And I had an opportunity to go into youth ministry in that uh, capacity there at Del Hart, and I did that for about three years, and then I decided I wanted to preach. So I, I went out and I tried to get a job at a few churches there in the area, and they looked at me like I was crazy. They said, we need somebody that's been to school, and so I asked my father-in-law, who was a graduate of SSOP from 1967, what I should do, and he talked about me coming to Sunset, and he told me two things. Over the course of the year, I, I got ready some things I need to remember. And I think this helps understand what we need to do before we go out, but also what we need to do as we experience burnout in our life, in our ministry. First thing he told me was dig your well deep. Second thing he told me is you only preach if you can't do anything else. So I wondered what he meant exactly, and he told me, he said, this is what it means to dig your well deep. He says, you need to go, and you don't go to get a degree, you don't go to get a piece of paper. He said, you need to go to learn, to learn how to study, to learn how to understand the Word of God, to how to present it, how to teach it, how to talk about it, and how to perform your tasks as a minister and do them well. And he said, if you don't dig your well deep, if your knowledge is not deep, if your understanding is not deep, then you're going to be more likely to burn out and to give up. Because ministry can be very hard. Now, at the time he said that to me, I thought, I'll just, I kind of ignored that a little bit. But the longer I thought about that, the more I understand that if I want to be in ministry for a lifetime, I need to prepare myself well. So my wife and I came here in 2002, and I felt like we were very well prepared to go out and preach the Word. But I also learned one really important lesson here is that you have to dig your well constantly. You constantly got to be adding things into your life. You've got to constantly be in the Word, in prayer, to help you be ready because people are going to pull from you and pull from you and pull from you until 
Sometimes you have absolutely nothing left. And that's where the danger lies. The second thing he told me is he says, you only preach if you can't do anything else. I thought, that is a ridiculous statement. I just didn't get that. And I had several other preachers tell me the same thing, and I was puzzled by that. I asked him, I said, what does that mean? And so I asked Leonard, I said, what does that mean? He said, you only preach if you cannot do anything else. I said, well, I'm a coach and a teacher. I've been doing it. I've done it well. He said, no, you don't get it. He said, you only preach if you have a passion and desire where you cannot literally do anything else because that is your desire in this life. You've got to have a passion and a zeal and the thought in your mind that you're going to preach for the rest of your life because you love it and you love people and you love talking about Jesus. So once I understood that, I came here with that intent to do those two things. So I graduated in 2004, and I felt very good about how I was prepared to go into ministry. Over the next 12 years, you have ups and downs. I had good and bad. But I still felt really good about the work. I was passionate about what I was doing. And I was satisfied with what I accomplished. But in the spring of last year, I became very tired. Physically, mentally, spiritually, and very resentful of the work. Work of ministry, I had just was worn out from it. I did not want to do it anymore. I loved Memphis. I loved the congregation there. They've been really good to work with and for. But I was completely and utterly burned out. I just had nothing left to give. I was not sure what to do. Uh, there's some things I wish I would have done differently. First, I want to say a little bit about burnout itself. I want to talk about a few things that happened but, uh, along the way. So what is burnout? Webster's Dictionary says it's to fail, to wear out, and this is the part I think is the most important, or become exhausted by excessive demands on energy, strength, and resources. It's not that you intend to get burned out. It's not that your elders intend to burn you out. It's that there's so much pull on you. If you're not constantly refilling your life and refilling your soul, you have nothing left to give. And you just get resentful of everyone. In fact, you want to go into a cave and hide because you just have nothing left to give. You feel unappreciated. You have no enthusiasm. And you resent everything that you're doing. I resented the work I did in the community, in the church, even things with my own family. It went to that point. It takes tremendous energy and time and effort. And I know everybody here knows that to be a good preacher. But I let all my energy and resources and strength go until I was running on complete empty. I was not refilling my tank. And so I let things get away from me. My greatest mistake of all was this. I did not reach out to the staff and teachers I knew here and come and try to ask them what I should do. That was my single greatest mistake. Write that down. Remember that. This is a place you need to be able to come back to and get help when you need it. That was my greatest mistake. My second mistake was I waited too long to do anything about it. I waited too long to do anything about it before I sought someone to help me. And my life and my spiritual life became very dysfunctional, very angry, and it took a toll on me and my family. So I want to tell you a story that I think will help maybe get the point across I want this morning, and that's this. There was a scientist with a group of scientists down at the South Pole doing research. The snowstorms are coming very quickly, so when they went out to do a job, they had four rules. You always take your walkie-talkie with you. You always carry a backpack that had supplies in it. You always make sure you go out in a group, and you take a long pole. They took these poles that were 20 feet long, and they used them to check the snow out ahead of them to make sure that they didn't fall in an ice cave or get on loose snow. Well, there was a job that was just a little ways out from where this man uh, was working, and, and nobody else was available to go. And so he broke every rule that they had except for one. He took that long pole with him. When he got out there, it took him longer than he thought. And when he got finished, the blizzard had come up, and he started to walk back to the base, which was not very far. He could see it. It was that close. But the blizzard blinded him, and he lost direction. He lost a sense of where he was at. And so he panicked. Because what am I going to do? If I miss the base by just a few feet, I will freeze to death out in this storm. 
So he said, I, I need to think of something I can do. So he took that long pole, and he had a red handkerchief, and he tied it on top of it, and he planted it in the ground. He said, this is going to be my center pole. This is what I'm going to keep focus on. He planted it in the ground, and each time he would, he would walk out so far until he could barely see the pole, and he would stop, and he would look and see if he could find the base. If he couldn't find the base, he would go back to the center pole and he would stand there and go, okay, what direction am I going to go next? And he marked which direction he'd be in. He did that about 10 or 15 times, and each time he needed to see the base. And finally he got a little discouraged. He said, maybe I'm not as close as I thought. Maybe this is not going to work. But he went out one more time. And he got out to the end of where the pole was, and he saw the base, and he went there, and he was saved. But see, that center pole kept him centered. Well, Jesus is our center pole. He's the one we always have to come back to. And the real message about burnout is you always have to come back to Jesus. That's going to be your center pole. He's going to be the one that gives you that uh, direction, that focus. You always need to come back to Him because we lose our way in ministry sometimes. We get burned out and we can't find our way home. So when we're frustrated and, and suffering and, and really not doing a good job, we need to go back and let Jesus refill us so there's two things i want you to think about this morning i'll try to to wrap this up here before too long first principle one one you've got to redig your well when you're burnt out you got to redig that well second thing is you've got to renew your passion and your zeal you got to remember why you cannot do anything else if you do those two things then you can recenter your life and you don't do the recentering god does it but he helps you recenter your life in Acts 4.13, it says, When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. You see, we have to go back and be with Jesus again. That's what's going to give you passion. That's what's going to give you zeal. That's what's going to get you, help you be encouraged. You've got to spend time with the Lord in prayer. And what I did is I started to just go out I went to the park, I went out in the country, I got away from my office, I got away from the phone, I got away from everything. I just went out and I just poured my heart out. I just prayed, I said, Lord, you've got to help me. I can't, I don't know what to do. I'm lost and burned out and I don't want to be this way, but I'm, I'm not good for my family, I'm not good for this church, I'm not good for anything. And I just started spending time with him and let the conversation flow out. I thought about Jesus in Gethsemane. He went there and he poured his heart out to the Father. And he got close. But I know that when he left Gethsemane, he had the strength to go and do what he knew needed to be done. I feel like he was re-energized by talking with the Father. We need to do the same thing. We've got to get away and talk to God by ourselves. And that's what he did. The second thing I did is I read the Gospels. I didn't read anything else. I didn't read books about burnout. I just started reading the Gospels. And I just tried to remember why I love Jesus. I read about the miracles, I read about his teaching, and when you do that again, what you do is you become astonished again. You're just like, wow, this is why I preach. This is the message I have. Without that, we have no passion, no zeal, no interest, because we get lost in the everyday things that come along in ministry. So I started to meditate on Christ and who he was and what he had done. That really helped me. Another thing I did is I started to read hymns. I just took my hymn book and I started to read and I started to research why those songs were written. That's really encouraging to do. That really helped me a lot. And I just started to sing hymns. I'd sing by myself. I'd go off in the car. I'd drive around the countryside. And people were like, I saw you 20 miles out. What were you doing? I'm just driving around singing, just talking to God, just trying to get my life refocused. There is great power in worship. When we focus on Jesus, it revives our soul. And there's so many great truths taught in hymns. A lot of songs encouraged me, but this kind of became my center song. It became my favorite song. It was not my favorite song before, but it became my favorite song. My hope is built on nothing less. I want to read just a little bit of that. Because this really helped me focus in again on Jesus. It says, my hope is built on nothing less. Then Jesus' blood in righteousness, 
And I dare not trust in the sweetest frame, but I wholly lean on Jesus' name. And when darkness veils His lovely face, I rest on His unchanging grace. And in every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. And when He shall come with trumpet sound, obey in Him, O oh may I then in Him be found, dressed in His righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, because all other ground is sinking sand. When I was burned out, I had to refocus on Jesus. I had to redig my well. But I had to have passion and zeal again. And those things I just told you helped me tremendously get my heart and my mind back. But another thing I did that's very important over in Proverbs, this really helped me a lot, was I started to talk to others. In Proverbs 17, 17, it says, A friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for adversity. And then in 27, 17, it says, As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. I had to be resharpened. I was dull. I was so dull, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. I was just out of it. And so I started to talk with others. I had several really good friends that were preachers in the area, and I started uh, pouring my heart out to them and talking with them. Men I trusted. I talked with a few close friends. I think it's a good idea to talk to a counselor. There wasn't anybody available or nearby where I was at, so I didn't do that. But I did get counseling from other preachers in the area. But I want you to, to take note of something. You need to be very careful about sharing your struggles with someone in your congregation. Because that doesn't always turn out so well. You need to share with people you trust, but they need to be away from your situation where you're at. And I'll be honest, you need to be very careful about sharing your struggles with your elders as a group. I don't mean you don't need to share with them, but I learned the first time I spoke to them about it, they were very smug and kind of like, I mean, they all have hard jobs. They're like, get over it. Well, I couldn't get over it. So I went and talked to them each individually, and that worked much better. So when you need to talk to your leadership, talk to them individually. I don't have 19 elders like, you know, a big place like this might have, but I, we had three. But when I talked to them individually, they started to understand what I was talking about and what I was going through. Another thing I think is very important to note is this. Be careful how much you tell your wife. It's easy to lean on your wife because it's your spouse, it's your best friend. But burnout is contagious. It is. It is. Your troubles and struggles will become your wives and your children. They will start to resent the church. They will start to resent your work. And they will start to resent you if you're not careful for a while, I leaned heavily on my wife and my son. I could tell that it was affecting them greatly. Now, my oldest son and I are very close, and he's 20 years old, but he was not ready for the things I was telling him, and so I backed off and quit talking to them about it. So I realized I need to talk to people that could help me not put the burden on my family. So be very careful about that. Also, something else that, I, that helped me a lot, and this is in Acts 2 and 46. I'm just about finished. As Billy McGuigan would say, I see conclusion at the end here. In 246, it says, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. There is great power in fellowship. And when you go in, in, in fellowship with the church, is what I'm talking about, with other Christian brothers and sisters, this is not going, you don't go teach them. This is not about teaching or preaching. This is about being with them. Sometimes you begin to resent the people that you're trying to, to work with. So to keep from resenting them, you have to go and be a friend with them. And they, that keeps them from resenting you and just seeing you as the preacher or their minister. They see you as their friend. So I started spending a lot of time. We had people into our home. I went out and talked to them where they worked. I went and spent time with them. I worked with them, talked with them, laughed with them, played games with them. And I was very encouraged by just being around them fellowshipping with them in every way possible. It brought joy back to my soul 
and I remembered who I was serving and why I was doing it. Those things helped me relax. They helped the congregation relax. And they helped ease a lot of tension between me and them. Burnout happens in preachers and missionaries because we give, and we should, out of our well without replenishing it, though. That's the danger. If you don't replenish your well, it will go dry, and you will burn out. I don't have any doubt that's why a lot of preachers quit. They get burned out, and they don't know what to do. And by the time they get through the burnout, they go and do something else instead. So to prevent burnout... Note these two things. Dig your well deep while you're here. Learn and grow and expand your mind. Prepare yourself. It's not about your grades. It's not about the degree. Those things are all nice. I got straight A's when I was here. I had a 98 average. But that's not, I didn't do that to get the grades. I did that so I would come out of here learning. When I did that, the rest took care of itself. So I'd be prepared. And number two, make sure that you're preaching because you absolutely cannot do anything else. You preach because you cannot, you do not want to do anything else. It is the desire of your heart. And when that burnout comes, three things. First, let the Lord recenter you. Let Him refocus you. He's got to be the center of that. Let Him redig your well. You've got to cooperate with that, but he, He's going to do the work. And let Him renew your passion. That's going to make all the difference in the world. I want to thank you for inviting me today, and I hope that a few of these comments helped you. I hope that you'll never experience burnout, but I would bet that you probably will in some shape, form, or fashion. So I wish you the best of luck, and Godspeed. Thank you.